Well, hi, everybody. This is Dear Mamasal again, and I'm hoping that, <laughs> that you will be able to get to this broadcast. Um, just so those of you who happen to be clicking in for the first time, uh, I tried to go live and it didn't work at all. So now I'm back again. I just need to let people know what the stream is so that they can uh, get there. Let me see if I can do that. And just so that you know, today we are going to be talking about two different things. One is how to look after your um, cats and dogs and dogs and cats uh, during the summer. Hi there, Jody. Um, during the summer. And the other one would be, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about what happened with the negotiations to sell my house this week. Because I think, you know, it's a lesson for everybody to learn if they choose to. So, um, Jody, could you just put me up the link that you are on, just so that I know which one uh, I need to repost? That would be awesome. Thank you. And so, for me, this has been a very, very stressful week. And... Stressful because, you know, big stuff was happening and it took its toll in certain ways. And I want to talk a little bit about what happened to me physically as well, just so that you guys can understand when you're doing something as important as this, you know, expect your body to react a little bit. But we're going to start by talking a little bit about what to do with your pets over the summer. Now, I know that some of my viewers are south of the equator and just going into winter, so they can uh, just store this information for uh, next year. But I really wanted to thank Jody, who did some research on the dog stuff, and I did some research on cats, because I realized that some people are dog people uh, and some people are cat people. And, you know, occasionally you have both. So what I wanted to talk about most of all is that whatever I'm about to tell you is sort of important but not altogether in my view altogether um, necessarily um, true and the reason I say that I lived I lived for 17 years in Africa in the hottest sun you can imagine and had dogs and I had dogs in cars, I had dogs walking on pavements and, you know, all these sort of things. And so part of me says it's a bit like everything else that, <laughs> you know, you can say that the, the, your hot temperature is too hot for a dog. And my reality is, well, not necessarily true because I've had dogs uh, in way hotter temperature than that that didn't die in a car or didn't die, you know, didn't get you know, blisters on their feet from walking on the pavement or whatever. So, you know, some of it to me is like, okay, let's think about this. Let's just get realistic. I want to share this just so that you can have some idea. And I think a lot of it, quite honestly, is common sense. I, I if, you know, if the, if the concrete is too hot to walk on with your bare feet, then, you know, that would be my, my test. You know, when you're out in the summer, you're likely to be out in flip-flops or something. Or, you know, just put your hand, um, just put your hand on the on the pavement. Find out how it is. Yes, Beth, it's one of the things I'm going to be talking about. So thank you for the input. She's saying grooming is one of the top things um, for any pet that has undercoat. Uh, because what's happening is that undercoat is trapping. So we're going to get to that one, Beth. But thank you for adding it. Um, so let me start here. And here are some of the things that um, Jody found. She said, pay attention to the temperature. 70 degrees Fahrenheit or 21 degrees centigrade begins the unsafe potential zone. And 80 degrees Fahrenheit and 26 degrees is life-threatening. The pet should be kept indoors during that time. So... I, I really have to say that um, I, I, you know, I wonder what, what basis that is on because, as I said, I have had pets in way hotter conditions than that, and they didn't die. So I think it's a little bit more than just the temperature myself. 
that I understand the feeling of it, all right? So just be careful. Once it gets above 80 degrees or 26 degrees, really be more aware of what's going on. And what they're saying, and I think this is common sense, all right? Um, when, it, when you go out for a walk, try and walk off the pavement, uh, off the sidewalk. You know, try and walk on grass because obviously that's not going to be hot enough to you know, fry eggs on. And I think that is the number one thing if you happen to have grass nearby. Now, if you don't, what are you going to do? Um, they suggest that you shorten the walk, all right? Don't spend too much time out there walking in that. Obviously, it makes sense to me that if, if it's that hot and you have concerns, then, you know, delay your walk until early morning or um, evening time, you know, you know when, when the temperature starts to drop again. Um, wherever possible, walk in the shade. Makes sense as well, doesn't it? And make sure that you're aware of your dog. If your dog needs to lie down for a little bit because it's too hot, then, you know, give him that, him or her that space. Um, again, another common sense thing in my view, which is bring fresh water with you. How do you do that? Uh, you know that the you know you've got these very fancy things that uh, you know pet stores sell, um, but you know quite honestly, uh, uh, a margarine container, empty one, obviously washed out nicely, uh, you know, and and some of your filtered water does very nicely. Yeah, exactly, Beth. That's what I'm saying. If you can't walk on the on the pavement or sidewalk without shoes, then how do you think your dog feels? Well, that's not quite. True. And I've got to say that, Beth, because dogs' paths are, you know, not the same as our feet. Our feet are not used to walking on on the pavement. I, mean, I actually make a point. I don't know about the rest of you. I make a point of walking without shoes quite regularly. And the reason is I want to make sure, you know, that my the soles of my feet are, are you know, not too tender. Yes. Now, you're saying that house dogs' pads, you know, the pad of the foot, are thinner. Yes, and the reason they're thinner is they don't spend the same amount of time outside toughening up their pads. Good point, all right? So that's why I'm saying, like your dog, um, you know, both you and your dog, you know, need to go out in without your shoes on occasionally. I, I am amazed how many times I've gone down the bottom of my driveway with the garbage to take it to the, you know, the, the roadside pickup. And people have said to me, oh, you haven't got shoes on. And I'm going, yeah, that's right. <laughs> like 10 out of 10 for observation. Um, but, you know, you'll hurt yourself. Why? Well, there's stones and, and things. Well, yeah. You know, uh, and I want to tell you, for uh, most of the time I was in Africa, I, I spent very uh, little time wearing shoes. I, I went barefoot a lot. And so this is really interesting to me that, that, that we discuss this in such a way. But Beth, a good point, right? The, the reason a house dog's pad are thinner is because they're not being toughened up all the time, whereas an outside dog, you know, it, it's walking on, you know, it's playing in the garden. It's getting, you know, it's getting um, toughened up much more. Good point. I love that. Um, so remember to take fresh water with you. I mean, if you can't take a margarine can or something in a backpack, then, you know, just take your water bottle and, and cup your hand and put some water in and let your dog have it. But remember that the heat of your hand is going to heat up the water a little bit. So that's why the other thing is to, if you really um, want to be thoughtful, is to take some ice cubes with you. You know, start the walk with ice cubes because as you walk, obviously they're going to melt, but you're going to have almost ice cold water for your dog, which uh, I'm certain your dog will appreciate. Um, protect your dog's paws if walking on hot surfaces. Now, there's a, apparently, I didn't know that, there's a non-toxic product called um, Pore Shield. 
or there's another one called um, Musher's Secret. And they're specially designed to protect your dog's paws. Now, the thing is that you can also apply that to their noses. And what the, the comment here is, be careful of Vaseline. I think a lot of people think, well, if I put the Vaseline on, that will help. But uh, if the problem with Vaseline is that dogs will lick it off and that's pretty toxic for them. So just think about that. All right, so now then, let's have a look at the cat situation. And the you know some of these go across both both cats and dogs. One of the things they recommend if you've got a cat, uh, just be aware that lighter colored cats, um, you know, get affected more than dark colored. So that was one of the things. The other thing is play, let them play with ice cubes. And I think this is true of dogs as well. I'm certain some of you probably already do this. You know, you take some, um, for cats, I would take some sort of fish water, um, some sort of brine almost, and just, you know, make some ice cubes specifically for your cat. All right. And what will happen is as the cat plays with it, number of things. Number one, um, you're going to have, um, it's going to cool their pores as they play, which is a good thing. And then secondly, uh, it's going to cool their nose because they're going to, you know, bonk it with their nose as well. So that's a really useful thing. Plus it's entertaining for the cat. So that's, I've always given my dogs ice cubes. I don't know about the rest of you. Um, how many of you have got cooling mats for your dog's bed? And they are available. And the other thing is, if you haven't got a cooling mat, maybe you've got some uh, ice packs in your fridge. So if it really is too warm uh, in in your house for you, then it's obviously probably too warm for your pet as well. So think about putting some ice packs under, uh, you know, obviously a, a good layer of uh, protection so that your cat or dog doesn't get uh, burnt by it. But, you know, just think about cooling it down with some ice packs. If you haven't got ice packs, just put some crushed ice into Ziploc bags and wrap them and then put them uh, in, you know, in your dog's or cat's sleeping area. The other thing is, and this is something I used to do, um, wet your cat or dog. Now, cats don't like to be wet, we understand that, but so if you've got a cat, I would take um, I would take a, a face cloth or something uh, with some ice water on it and just literally rub it over your cat. Um, if my dogs got too hot, I would take them downstairs to the <laughs> hose pipe and I would just hose them down because the obviously letting the hot water run out of the hose first. I must say that because if it's that hot, then the water in your hose is going to be really hot. So run the water until it gets too cold and then, you know, just let your dog get good and wet. They'll shake most of it off. We know that they have a wonderful way of doing that. But, you know, what will happen is the residual um, damp will help um, cool the body down. So, um also, if you fear that, you know, just cool the pads, cool anything you can with, you know, a, a cool, wet face cloth. It's, it's an easy thing to do. Now, the, to Beth's point, which is excess fur attracts the heat in. And so, you know, really make sure that during the hottest months of the year that you are grooming even more than you would normally do. Just, you know, make it a daily uh, ritual at a certain time that you sit down, bond with your cat or dog, and groom them. Uh, if you've got a very long-haired animal, can you know, consider um, sh having them properly shaved? Or, you know, if you've got... You know, I've I've had husky type dogs and and German shepherds. You know, they have that really thick undercoat um, in the 
And, you know, it's just like as long as you keep brushing them every day and keep that undercoat clear as far as you can, that dead that dead um, undercoat, uh, you will find it a lot better. You know, the other thing is what I find a lot of people do, and I just want to say this, they remember to groom the top. Um, but the, the, quite a few people forget to groom underneath. You know, turn your pet over and groom the, the, the underneath area because that's where a lot of the clumping will happen. It's amazing how many people just seem to groom the top. They don't groom, they don't groom here in the armpits. Um, they don't groom, you know, at the back. Um, you know, it's interesting with dogs, especially dogs with that sort of a coat, with, with that thick coat. Um, I found lifting the tail and then uh, grooming almost like the butt cheeks, if you like, uh, area, because that normally ends up being very thick fur and nine times out of ten isn't groomed as much as it should be, so it will be inclined to clump. So that's another area, plus it's you know all around that area that you want to keep cool. All right, so I hope this is making some sense. The other thing is pretty obvious, but keep fresh, cool water available. And again, um, I would recommend um, making a contraption almost with an upended Coke, big Coke bottle, you know, a two-liter one, cut the top off it, Make a, contract, a contraption that will hold it so that you can just drop ice cubes into it. And then as it melts, it'll then run into your dog's bowl. Um, and if you've, got, if you've got that bottom part in the water, it won't overflow. It'll just keep filling it up. And you, it'll be easy for you to see that it's time to refill because there won't be any ice cubes left. You know, they're, 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 you'll be able to see the water level there. But keep... I would also recommend keep more water uh, available. In other words, if you normally have a place for the dog's water, uh, double the number of places you have water, you know, so that the dog knows that it has water available. And think about where you're going to put it. And part of me goes, look for a cool, a cooler area of your home to put it. Don't put it where the sun is blasting, obviously. You know, find a cool place to put it. Um, interesting that cats can get sunburn, and I was talking about that, particularly the pale colored ones, apparently. And their ears and noses uh, can be susceptible. So did you know there's such a thing as um sunblock for cats. I didn't know that. Oh, Beth is saying, ask for a puppy cut for your pup during the summer. Yes, absolutely. If you've got a, a long-haired, thick-coated dog, you know, get it. I'm thinking about things like a, a golden doodle or something like that, you know, that's a big dog with a lot of hair. Uh, I used to do that with my, one time I had an old English sheepdog. Uh, in in Africa, and in when it really when it really got hot, even you know really hot there was very very hot, and um, I would then you know make sure that we trimmed a lot of the hair off the dog, but remember not to trim it too short, and the reason for that is because in some ways their coat protects their skin. You think about that, all right? So the heat is hitting the fur, not the skin. So if you give them, shave it too close, you're going to end up with um, bigger problems than you have before. Um, cats and dogs, you know, be aware if they are panting too much or, you know, they look uncomfortable. And, and just, again, you know, I found... Sometimes you can even roll up um, a wet towel and just you know, wring it out and just put it close to them so they can lean against it. That will help as well. You'll be surprised. Uh, if you've got a, a waterproof, um, almost like a mini tarp thing, you know, put a damp towel down so they can lie on it if they want to. And you'll be surprised how many of them will want to do that. As some of you might be lucky enough to have a kiddie's um, paddle pool. 
you will be amazed how many dogs will really appreciate that. <laughs> uh, what I used to do with my dogs uh, when uh, Yvonne had her grandchild here um, is that I would go down and, you know, we, we would <laughs> throw balls into the uh, paddle pool so that that the dog would go into the pool to get the ball. But, you know, what I knew was that each time it was getting wet and therefore cooling down a bit. Um, be careful for the breathing. Watch out for the breathing. Um, it, it, the, you know, rapid breathing, uh, or if the skin is hot to touch, you know, all signs, you know, if, if they start vomiting, it's like a human. All right, that they their their signs of sunstroke are a lot like ours. Um, so then you know, make sure that we are so lucky that we've got um, the internet today. Um, but you know, if you really think your your animal has got sunstroke, then you obviously get them to a vet or see what you can do. Um, I would say be extra careful, and I know you're careful anyway, but be extra careful that your pet doesn't get trapped in a hot room. And when I say trapped in a hot room, you know, it's like sometimes a door closes and the animal ends up being in a room without any water. And so, you know, think about that. Um, if necessary, you know, tie some socks over the... Um, lock of any door so that the door cannot close. Um, or actually it can close, but um, you know, put a stopper in your doors so that they can't close if necessary. Um, if you have got something like a greenhouse, a glass house, whatever you call it, wherever you are, if you uh, have a greenhouse, be extra careful that your puppy doesn't get in there or your cat you know, in the summer because it's bad enough in regular times, but with the blazing sun, very dangerous place. And that is why I would recommend that you just keep checking where are they. You know, that, that's, that would be my mantra. It's really hot, where's my dog? Or where's my cat? So that you can keep an eye on where they are and, and help them. So I hope that helps a little bit. <laughs> and if any of you watching on the replay have any other tips or things that you like to do to help your puppy, you know, feel free to leave them in the comments below because every idea is shared is an another person um, that will, you know, get more information. Thanks, Jody. I, I appreciate that. But thank you for doing some of the research for me. I really appreciated that. I, I want to move on to talking to you a little bit about negotiations. And I don't know if any of you um, are interested, but I, I obviously did the biggest negotiation of my life um, this week. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I am selling my home and possibly it is sold. Uh, I've had an offer that I've accepted. And uh, it, I don't consider it sold until the subjects come off. Now, the, the subjects mean that they say, I am prepared to buy your house as you know, long as I've had an inspection done, uh, uh, you know, that I can get the insurance, that I can get the financing sorted out, da, 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 da. So they have all sorts of subjects that they put on. Now, all those have to be removed by July the 12th. Okay. When they are removed, I will have a sale. Now, the reason that it's so important that the subjects get removed is because it affects my next step. Uh, and my next step is to, I, I'm actually going to the bank on Tuesday because now what I need to negotiate is I've got house number one. <laughs> I've got house number one here and I've got, to buy another house. So this will be house number two over here. And somewhere I cannot buy house number two until the money comes through from house number one. Does that make sense? So this pen doesn't work very well, does it? So what we're going to do, let me try and find a better working pen for you. <sighs> that 
that'll probably work a little better. So what we're going to do um, is go to the bank and say, I want to, here is a clean offer uh, for my house, you know, clean as in the subjects are removed. And this is what I want to buy. And that offer is uh, only dependent on the money. I haven't got that point to that point yet. But then they will, you know, if all things add up, they will give what is called a bridging loan. Okay, which means they know you've got X amount of money here waiting to be released uh, on the day of completion, but you need this money now to purchase this place. Does that make sense to everybody? So as long as those two are both clean deals, then they will issue, you know, and everything else that they want is okay. They will then issue what's called a bridging loan. Does that make sense to everybody? So, and obviously you pay through the nose for it, but you know, at least it's available. So what I'm going to do on Tuesday is to go and find out how many, yeah, how many of the boxes can I check on that bridging loan requirement? Now, it may be that I don't meet all their boxes because I'm retired and all sorts of things. So that's what I'm going to go and find out. What I wanted to talk to you a little bit was about the negotiation. Because I think it's important if you, and also about um, the stress level and the physical reaction my body had to, to actually doing the deal. And I thought you guys might be interested in that. Um, what, what did it feel like and what, <laughs> you know, what were my, what did I have to let go of to make the deal happen? All those sort of things. And I, I've always said to you that as, as this process goes along, I want to discuss as many of the things as I can so that you can understand it. Now, this doesn't matter whether it's a negotiation to sell your beta car or to sell my beautiful home. The, the, the system is the same. You understand that this is the buyer and I am the seller in this case. Okay. Now, it, I'm certain you all agree that the buyer wants the best possible price, as low as possible, right? And the seller will want as high as possible. That's what I call no-brainer stuff. So here's what happened. They came in with a with a low ball offer. I don't mind telling you, it was definitely a low ball. Uh, let me just do it in terms of how much under the um, asking price it was. Their initial price was about eighty thousand, no, seventy thousand below asking. Okay. So. That was their initial price that they came in with. I looked at it, and, and the, what you need to let go of is the insult. You know, because your, your first comment, your know, first thought is, that is an insult. All right? And so the first thing that you need to do is just let go of the insult. Also, be aware of the culture. Um, in my case, this was an East Indian um, family. And, you know, they love to barter. They love to do the trading up backwards and forwards. I personally think it's a, you know, a waste of time. But, you know, that's just my stuff. I need to let go of that. It's what they like to do. So you go, okay, fine. So now my job is to come back with a counter, okay? This is their offer. Don't take it personally. That's what they're hoping they can get away with. And now I get to counter. So my original price is what I have to keep in mind. And what I did is I, when I went back with the counter, I took off 10,000 only. And the reason I only took off 10,000 is I wanted to send the message, buddy, you better come a long way 
up from here if you want this house. All right? Now, does that make sense? I, I you know, this is like, I, I'll move, but I'm not moving much. So then it gets down to, wow, what's going to happen next, right? The next offer was the one I was interested in. So they had it, and they thought for a while, and then they came back with an offer that was about 40000 less than my asking. I'm just making sure that that's right. 90. Yeah, about 40000 less. And... My realtor and, and I had discussed this, and what the, my realtor had warned their realtor was, I'm a pretty straight up person, so don't play this game for too long, because I will get bored, right? <laughs> and I, I won't want to play the game anymore. So when my realtor heard that they were thinking of offering this, my realtor went back, because we'd already discussed this and said, is this their final offer? Hi, Carrie. Is this their final offer? Because it could be the final one that our client accepts. Right? She's taken the counter. She's you know done the first part, but she's probably not going to do this a second or third. She's probably not, you know, may not do this a second time. So we just want to warn you, make sure that this is the best offer they can come up with. Or, you know, how much do they want the house is what really what you're asking. And before we do all the paperwork. So, you know, we'll give you an extra hour to think about that or whatever, discuss it with the, you know, with the buyer and then come back to us. And the interesting thing was that this price changed to 30000 under my asking. just by bothering to say, think about that. All right, now then, you know that I don't particularly want to drop 30,000 in, you know, if I can help it. But what do I need to let go of? This is the thing that I have to remember, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to sell my house. All right, that's my number one goal. Number two, my house is not without problems. All right. I've got quite a few issues that will affect the price of my home. So I've got problems. I've got to remember that. Okay. It's not a perfect house for people to buy. Um, what else do I have to think about? Uh, the market is absolutely dead. Okay. Um, when I say absolutely dead, it, it is amazing how bad the market is at the moment. To give you some sort of idea, um, the the number of properties of the size of my house in the last in my area in the last 45 days zero have sold so you understand this is this is a really dead market so i have to th sort of think about all of these things and i went you know something dropping 30000 what does it bring me all right, and that's the other side that you need to think about. Dropping 30,000 brings me a sale, which is what my goal is. It brings me a situation where I can be out of debt, which is very important. Now, I know what you're saying. I could have played the game a bit longer and maybe got a little bit more. I don't think so. I actually had a pretty good idea from their first offer where they wanted to end up. <laughs> Think about that, all right? Because here was the price of my house and they came in minus 70,000, all right? So what is the half of that is about 35,000, right? 30 to 35,000 I knew was where they wanted to, to end up. You know, they come up a bit I come down a bit, they come up a bit, I come down a bit, they come up a bit. We're going to end up around about here. And I did that math 
before we did the first counter. I knew that they probably wanted to be in this area. And so I literally, before I even put in the first counter, started to think, what do I need to let go of to make this happen? All right. Now, the interesting thing is that when they came back with that offer, I also remembered that the terms, the subjects did not include the words and the sale of our house because most people have to sell their house to be able to do a deal. These people didn't need to sell a house. They are actually a young couple that are living with their parents, so they did not need to sell anything. That is a bonus for me, all right? That makes the deal a lot more solid than some other ones that I could have to wait six months for them to sell the house. Do you understand? So what I decided was it's a big decision, but I'm going to take the money and run. You know, the, the two things kept in my mind. You know, I spent a lot of time talking to Benji as well, for those of you who know Benji. And Benji kept saying two things to me that really stuck in my mind the whole way, you know, from his experience of being in, in real estate as well. Number one is if you are in a dropping market and ours is dropping dramatically, get ahead of the drop. In other words, if the market is dropping 7%, you know, be prepared to go down eight or nine to sell your house. Get ahead of it. The other thing is don't get caught up in the, well, you know, if I hang on for another six months, I might get more. You know, if you hang on for another six months, and he told me he had that happen to his, him once. He had it happen where he hung on for another six months and ended up losing a lot more. So there's no guarantee that in six months, you know, this market is going to be better. There's no guarantee that in a year it's going to be better. And I you know, and I can't afford to hang on that long, quite honestly, you know, unless I start renting out <laughs> rooms in my house, which I don't want to do. So you understand, I've got to understand what is my goal. My goal is to sell the house. I obviously want to sell it at a, you know, the best price I can get. But in a totally dead market, I also have to let go of some of the Disneyland. Does, does that make sense to everybody? And so whenever you're doing a negotiation, understand that you need to end up where both people feel that they've, fair enough, all right, that, that both people feel, yeah, we, we got the best deal we could. Um, and, and, and that's what I was going for. I, you know, I could have gone back and, and, and said, no, 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 I want more money. And they could have walked away. All right. And, you know, I wouldn't have blamed them, quite honestly. Because I was, you know, I knew, remember, I knew roughly where that middle point was for them, right at the beginning. Um, right. Now, Beth is saying it also helps to counter with their low amount, uh, with a little bit higher and adding the closing cost to the buyer. Yeah, and those, you can play those games. Yeah, I understand that. I, quite honestly, I didn't do any of those, Beth, because I, I really thought it was a fair price. Um, and they had already, in just from my knowledge, they had already come up about 15000 more than they probably wanted to spend. From, from what I did at that initial calculation, they had already come up 15000 So to me, I'm going, what is fair? By the way, all sorts of other things came into play, and I want, yeah, I think you guys know me pretty well. Right, they wanted Yvonne to stay. So you understand that was important to me, that Yvonne wouldn't be thrown out. All right, she wouldn't be, um, you know, asked to leave just because I needed to. So that was really important to me. That had value, you know. So there were lots of bits to it. So I accepted the deal. <laughs> and uh, we now play. You know, the house will get inspected by the bank. Um, oh, don't worry. Beth is saying, I bet they raise her rent, though. Yeah, it's possible. And if and Yvonne knows that as well. So, you know, you don't think I thought about that before I did the deal? You know, I made sure um, that Yvonne's rent was shown to be as low as I could make it. <laughs> you know, because they, they can increase it, but, you know. 
not a wise thing. <laughs> and so to me, I, I, you know, I really didn't inflate her, the rent she was paying or anything like that. I kept it pretty low. <laughs> and the other thing I said to them was, you know, and they asked, you know, when did I last, you know, up the rent? And I said, we, we don't do that. You know, you know, the funny thing is Yvonne has always upped the rent. I haven't. One thing somebody taught me a long time ago, yeah, probably 30 years ago, if you are a landlord and you have a good tenant, <laughs> don't rush to put the rent up. All right, Keep the rent as low as you can and then only up it when, when that good tenant is gone. All right, so I get you, Beth, and, you know, it's possible they could up the rent by quite a bit. But Yvonne would have to agree to it. Do you understand? So she gets to choose. It's not my choice. It's there. It's Yvonne's. So that is out of my league. So now we play the waiting game while the house um, will be inspected by the bank, the buyer's bank, to make sure that it's worth the money that they are offering for it, which, by the way, it really is. And so I'm pretty clear on that one. They haven't got to sell a house. And the other subjects that they have are perfectly normal things. You know, there's nothing weird in there at all. And so I'm pretty sure that uh, we probably do have a sale. But you know me, it's not a sale until it's done. So here's the thing. Now <laughs> I will start looking. Does that make sense? I really am starting to get my realtor to get uh, some things lined up because now it is worth looking. I, I know a lot of you were asking me from the get-go, where are you going to go? Where are you going to go? And I said, I won't know until I have sold my house. Now, the reason I say that is because until I know what the final selling price is, I don't know how much money I've got to buy the next place, All right? So now I know what that's going to be, roughly, you know, excluding the costs and everything else that I'm still going to have. Now I know what I'm dealing with. Now I have to decide how much of that amount do I want to spend on a new property? And the answer is as little as possible. <laughs> to get what I want. And what I've been having big conversations with my realtors about are, what are my real have-to-haves? I have to have light. One of the wonderful things about the house that I'm in, and for those of you who have seen the pictures, it is incredibly light in here. I've got big windows streaming light in. Um, so light to me is a very important thing. I suffer from seasonal um, SAD syndrome, you know, seasonal affective disorder. So when it gets to the winter time, I have to be really careful. I take lots of vitamin D and stuff so that I do whatever I can. My, my lighting, I try to have natural light, lighted bulbs as much as possible because I know I, uh, you know, I lived my life, so much of my life in, in, in Africa, where there's so much light, and then to come into very little light is in, it very difficult for me. The other thing for me is I like space, okay? When I say space, um, I'm an artist. I need somewhere I can make a mess uh, if I can. So I'm prepared to, to do one bedroom if I need to, but I need an enclosed balcony, you know, somewhere I can turn into an art area or I can um yes so Beth is saying also how much money do I need to live on for the rest of your life all right so that's a very good thing that was my other thing all right that's why I said I obviously want to put in as little as possible in some ways so here was my thinking Beth my thinking which is why do you see I just squared off a little bit of that total amount that was the reason why <laughs> but Remember that this amount, whatever I spend, Beth, is also part of what I have for the rest of my life. Because in about 10, 15 years' time, God willing, I am probably not going to be able to live wherever I'm about to buy. I will need to be in care, right? I'm already 72. 
So you know, it's going to be, um, but this property will be the money I am putting aside, if you like, for that time. Does that make sense? So I want to spend as little as possible, but also whatever I buy here, the way I've looked at it, uh, Beth, is whatever I buy here is money that I'm locking up for my care later in life. Does that make sense? So I might put away a little bit more than I plan to just to make sure I've got enough put away that I can't spend on canvases and Amazon and, you know, my friends. But a good point. So the question is, how much do I need to live on for the rest of my life? So what I need is I've got two options. Yeah, so Beth is saying, I would like to suggest to invest in wherever you live to an awesome art room, all right, Being because you're passionate about your art and it'll keep you young. Yeah, I, I quite agree. So that to me is a really important, that's why I'm saying I need two, I need two bedrooms. Uh, one, not, not for a spare room, one to be an art room uh, that I can close the door on and, and not worry about it being a mess because, you know, the way I paint is messy. <laughs> I, I know a lot of people don't make mess, but I make mess because of the type of painting I do. So, and, and you know, also I want to look at the outside space. Is there space for me to paint outside in the summer? You know, that's what I'd also, like, um, I, I'm very seriously considering a manufactured home, you know, with with a workshop. <laughs> and, and so, you know, either to turn the workshop into a art studio you know, and buy um, another shed to put the lawnmower in. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? It's like, is that, a, is that a nice space that I can walk out of that place and, and go into an art room? So, you know, there are lots of things to look at, and I don't have a lot of time. That was the other thing. Think about this. They, the closing date is the end of August. That is not very far away. Any of you having a little panic moment just on that one? But again... Look at it this way. You see, this is what I keep trying to explain to you. You know, one step at a time. How much, how, how much can you see that taking the one step at a time has really worked well for me? Not to worry about steps two, three, and four. Just take the next step. So now, what was I going to tell you about? <laughs> Hang on a second, I've got to think about this. There was an important thing I was about to discuss. Hmm. If nobody can remember, it's not worth discussing. What was I talking about? Oh, the other thing, I hope one of you will remember. But the other thing is, at this stage of my life, do I want to go through another reno? You know, I did a big reno on this house, nearly 100,000 bucks worth of reno on this house. I don't want to do that again. I'm not saying I won't do little upgrades. Where did I get my green juice thing? From Ben, I, I bought it from Benji in the days when he first started doing green juice. Um, all right, so. One of the things I'm looking for now is something space light, yep, but I also want upgrades, right? I don't want to buy somewhere that has not been upgraded. The reason why it's really important for my mental health is <laughs> I upgraded my house. So I have top of the line, as you know, fridge. I have top of the line microwave, dishwasher, top of the line, washer, dryer. Do you get what I'm standing? You know, for me to go into something that has not been renovated since the 70s and has got that, you know, an old dishwasher and an old, um, you know, oven and stuff like that and an old looking kitchen. Now, the funny thing is, Luckily, the reason I love to work with my realtor is because my realtor knows me really well. So uh, I, I don't know if you can remember. 
<laughs> yeah, make sure the internet lines are good. Yeah, thank you. But, you know, um, one of the things that I did when I looked originally, I did went, go and have a look originally at the start of all this stuff. But, you see, my realtor knows me really well. You know, if there happens to be wood paneling, they know that Mama Sal is one of those people that she'll get rid of that wood paneling in a hurry. You know, she'll put paint on it, you know, maybe paint a mural on it or something. You know, she's not going to worry about the color of the wall. Walls are paintable. A lot of houses don't sell because the owners have painted walls red or green or yellow. To me, that is so easy to cover up. Right, that's something that um, wouldn't be a deal breaker for me. I'm much more interested. Does the kitchen, you know, does it basically does it have the modern appliances? I'd like to start with that. Why? Because to replace those is ten grand to start with. Does it have, you know, a decent countertop, preferably a good one, you know, because that's a lot of money. What about the bathrooms? I have to make sure that the bathrooms have a walk-in shower, not that I have to walk into a tub. Why? I am 72 now. Well, I think I'm about to be 73, or am I about to be 72? Right? So that's really important. Um, Beth is saying closet space. I think wall space is more important to me than closet space because so much of my life is now in little cubies, all right? So I, I'm going to be looking at walls and going, I can build a complete cubie container on that wall. You know, I've got, I've got them in different rooms, but now I can do a solid wall of them if I need to. So to me, the sort of closet space I don't need as much as I might have done. Hi, Niasha. Does that make sense, Beth? Um, what I do need is, um, I, you know, to me, I would be, when I move, part of what I will be discussing with you is this is what I've got. This is what my dream is to create here. All right. If you remember when I wanted to build the studio, I went out and spent a couple of hundred bucks on, on shelving and crates and made a complete um, wall for my crafts. All right, where I could keep different things. And it still works really well. And by the way, it's just going to get dismantled now. Uh, as soon as I, I won't dismantle anything until the subjects are removed. Do you understand that? Because I may have to go back to going back on show if the subjects aren't removed. So I can't take that next step until the subjects are removed. Making sense? So I would like to have... The basic upgrades done, kitchen and preferably bathroom. However, I don't know about you, but if it has a good kitchen and the bathroom, you know, still has, what should we, let's think of some stuff, you know, still has gold uh, accents to the shower or, you know, still has the old sink. You know, a new sink, as you know, from seeing my house, all right, a new sink actually is 200 bucks for a really nice waterfall sink. What costs the money is the guy to come in and put it in for you. So to me, this is like, okay, fine. I can look at an old bathroom and go, I can repaint this and I can bring somebody in to give me another waterfall basin. I'm going to miss my, you know, my wash hand basin. So, you know, that is doable. I'm prepared to do that, right? So this is all that's going through my, and I've been doing this list for a long time, as you can imagine. Um, all right, so Beth is saying closet space is important to you because you can't stand too much clutter. Clutter, I have discovered, is my trigger of being closed in and locked away from the world. Yes, you know something? I have to say that the greatest gift I've been given in this process, Beth, is being forced to be tidy for, the, for this long. Because now I am pretty sure that I've got the message. <laughs> you know what I mean? That living without clutter actually makes dusting so much easier. It makes everything so much easier. And, you know, all the people who said to me, um, you know, a place for everything and everything in its place, you know, 
I now, that's what I love about the cubies because you can, I just chuck things into the relevant cubie. Um, and so I'm, you know, I, I think that um, Jody, you're learning this one, right? That getting things into a box uh, is a really great way to declutter. Niasha has a really clever thing that she does, just so that you know. Um, Niasha um, recycles boxes. So what she does um, is that she'll take a cardboard box, you know, be it a cereal box or whatever, and she will repurpose it. You know, she'll cover it with material or she'll paint it or do whatever and, you know, make use of it. Some of you know, hang on a second. Yeah, Jody's saying that those cubies have changed her life. I quite agree. Um, all right, so how about this one? I used to work in an office where we had envelopes, and I used to collect the envelopes, boxes, and then I painted them just the end that's going to show and a little bit around the sides. And I literally have probably 30 or 40 of these that I keep in this one, as you can see, extension cords and, and electrical timers. All right? So Niasha, I, I totally got it when you were telling me about, you know, re upcycling boxes. It's a really good thing to do. And it's a really good thing, you know, if you can't afford to buy cubies, um, you know, it's a really good thing to find consistent. I find that the, you know, like uh, the Kleenex boxes are very useful for storing things in. And I do the same thing, right? I just paint the ends. And I can then put them all in on a shelf. But, you know, I've got everything together. You know, these are the chandelier type light bulbs are all in one. You know, the, you know what I mean? It's like it helps you get things into uh, easy things. So when, you, when I need um, room fresheners, you know, I've got a Kleenex box that has just got room fresheners in it. Um, I've got another one with Swiffers in it. You know, so everything... Instead of being all hucked in, I actually do have a lot of them separated out as well. So that is really important. So yes, obviously closet space. Um, if I can, if I can get it, you know. Uh, but again, I'm looking at it this way, Beth. You know, if I end up that I don't have all the closet space I would like, then what I would probably do is, I know this sounds weird, I would probably put a sub floor and put my bed higher up. You know what I mean? If I would probably put my bed on a pedestal that was this high, if I have to build it if necessary, so that I've got this much storage space under my bed, you know, and I'd put drawers in it that I could pull out. Um, the other thing is, Beth, what do you keep in your closets, all right? So the other thing I'm doing, and some of you know about this, I've been systematically downsizing the amount of number of clothes I've got. The other thing I've started to do, and I do recommend that as well, which is have seasonal clothes, all right? In other words, you may well have 20 T-shirts, but only have six of them that are summer ones. All right. And then put the rest of them away. Now, these sort of shirts, you know, do all the different seasons. Right. But, you know, what I'm trying to do is to say, for example, um, that isn't a QB. Hang on a second. Yeah, sure. Let me show you what a QB is. Okay, Niasha, this is a cubie, all right? This this sort of, it's about, 
just about over a foot, I guess, wide. That that's called a cubie. If you like the boxes that I had, a mini, <laughs> a mini cubies. All right. <laughs> um, all right. So I'm, I'm talking about clothes now. So for example, um, I will take my uh, oranges, uh, those sort of colors, and I'll put them together. Um, I'll put them together as my four colors, all right? Browns and, you know, um, my orange shirts and things like that. I will then take my reds and things like that for my winter, you know, Christmas time, or would be more reds and stuff like that. So they go into that season. And, and does this make sense? The other thing is you get to change clothes four times a year. You know what I mean? Change colors which isn't a bad idea. Um, so, you know, it's just like, do, how much closet space do I need? I need storage space, not necessarily closet space. Mm. Now, the other thing is, I have started thinking... If I'm moving by the end of August, and we'll know for sure in a couple in a couple of days, um, if I'm moving at the end of August, number one, it's my birthday, and it's also the time that Big Brother Jeff is due to arrive. So, how many of you want that stress? All right. However, I want the sale of the house. <laughs> Now, it may be that I end up negotiating a possession a bit later. I don't know. I'm, I'm going to try not to do that. So, again, what I need to do, and I think this is where we were earlier that I couldn't get back to. What I need to do is say, what, what is going to cause me stress? Okay. Right. So now then, how much of my house is already packed up? Quite a bit. Two areas are not packed up. And I, I have to do some serious work. One is my shed. And the other is to finish in my garage. I've done about half my garage, but, you know, I've now got my, my garage is like this. And I've got boxes and I've got row, you know, shelves of stuff. So what I want to do is to get probably one day we'll fix the shed and most of what's in the shed will probably get thrown away but do you understand that until i know where i'm going i won't know whether i need to keep my lawnmower or my <laughs> you know if i end up in an apartment i'm not going to leave my need my lawnmower or all my gardening tools and all that sort of stuff make sense so my shed i've got to go and tidy it up and then also put things like I've got a beautiful hammock in there that you know I, I want to I, I obviously if I end up moving into an apartment I'm not going to need my hammock sadly so I would prefer not to do that my garage I've got a lot of wood and stuff and all my equipment I've got routers and table saws and all sorts of things you know, all my um, woodworking equipment in the garage. Again, if I end up in an apartment, I will have to get rid of all of those. So you can understand why going to an apartment is not my first choice at all. So what is the stress? Moving itself is stressful. So let me see how clever we all are. What do I need to let go of to make moving less stressful? Let's see how much you've learned. Okay? Because that's the first thing I ask myself. What do I need to let go of to make moving less stressful? We know moving is going to be stressful. What are your recommendations? Let's see what you come up with. <laughs> Think about this. If you've ever moved, what made moving stressful?
Dum 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 dum. I'm not getting any feedback. Right, Jody. <laughs> that is the number one thing. Jody's saying, do not do everything yourself, which is delegate. Okay. Now, here's my thinking, Jody. We know that upstairs is almost totally packed up anyway, right? I've really just got cubies all over the place in my units, and I've got clothes in my closets. That is not a lot of packing. So what I asked myself was, how do I do this the easiest possible way? is to call in a moving company and tell them to come and pack me up. What do you think? What do I have to let go of? Money. That will cost me money, which, by the way, I will have. Plus, they will do it properly. You, you know what I mean? They will actually <laughs> wrap my artwork properly. They will wrap my glass tables properly. They will, you know, do this properly. So therefore, I actually would have peace of mind. Now, I, I also thought about the fact, yes, exactly, Jody, you're, you're on the same thinking as I am. So therefore, do you understand this letting go of money is, is, is actually an investment in my health? is the way that I look at it. So as soon as the subject's clear on the 12th, I will be calling a moving company. And the first question that they're going to ask me is, where are you moving to? And I'm going to say, I don't know yet. But as soon as I know, I will let you know, there is a possibility I might be moving everything I own into your warehouse. All right. All right, so Niash is adding in, do what you can and what you cannot do. Um, you're right. And take your memories and keepsakes, but realize you can't take everything. I can take everything. <laughs> really, I can take everything I've got in my house. And I can resort it as I unpack it. How many of you know that I'm more likely to do that? All right. I've done a major sort already over the last year. But now I've got it into boxes. Now, as I unpack each box, I will sort again. And I've got hopefully the next 10 years to play that game. All right. I know the important stuff is the stuff that's still upstairs right now. The unimportant stuff to me is downstairs because it's in a box that I haven't unpacked. So what I've got upstairs will be the critical stuff. This will move straight in to my new place. The other boxes, I can start, you know, I can put them in a warehouse if necessary or in a storage locker, and they'll just go and get a box a week or a couple of boxes a month and just unpack them and, and, and either throw it away or sell it. Makes sense. That's the way that I'm thinking. So do you all agree that the, mo the most important thing is to be as stress-free as possible? Also, remember the big brother Jeff is going to be here. I do not want to be absolutely exhausted when big brother Jeff arrives, all right? Because I'm probably going to have to go on vacation with him. So delegating now is my number one thing. So the moment, um, yeah, that's Marie Kondo, uh, Niasha, that you're talking about. Yeah, if it brings you joy, keep it, right? Hi, Aaron. So do you understand that all the time I'm looking at what is left to do that is stressful and how am I going to reduce the stress? Now, you probably know that to do the garage, I am going to call on the same person that did the major purge for me um, six months ago, which was Doug, right? Doug is really good. You know, he doesn't have any emotion about stuff when he's doing that sort of stuff. And I will work with him and he will help me clear out another half of my garage. Even though there are boxes in there, even though you know we've already done half of it, he will help me do the other half and we'll do that in one day. He will also help me if I'm lucky. <laughs> He'll also help me with the shed if I need. But I'm thinking that maybe Wade will help me with the shed because 
you know, he's he's done so much in there. So can you see that this is all about asking myself, what do I need to let go of? And what I need to let go of as much as possible is the stress. Will there be stress? Yep. And I want you to say, because I think it's important, after... Um, when that first offer came in, I spent a lot of time going backwards and forwards with my realtor about where I wanted to go next. You know, I said, I want to give them an uh, a counter very close to my original price because I want them to know I'm not going to go down very much. I want them to get that message loud and clear. So, you know, I spent a lot of time on the first one. By the time they came back with the second counter, you know, I knew exactly where I wanted to be, and I knew they'd already come to where their first place was, where they prepared to come up a little bit more. And that's why I said, before we do the paperwork, ask them if they want to just make another adjustment, because it could be the last offer for them. And they did. They came up another 15000 Yay. Yay. Um, so the whole thing is, how do I make this as stressless as possible? However, what I noticed... Once the deal was done, and by the way, it took time because you've got to, you know, luckily we do a lot of the stuff electronically these days. You can do it digitally. But, you know, once it was all done, and you remember, Jody, the night before, I'd only had four hours sleep, right? So I was not batting on all brain cells. Um, but anyway, once the deal was done, the, re the relief, you can imagine, was, was huge. What I noticed, and I thought I would mention this, I was talking to Niasha about, um, you know, be aware of what stress does for you um, subconsciously. I was talking to him about Niasha that I can remember a very, when I was um, much, much younger in my teens, uh, I started pulling out the, um, uh, the eyelashes, eyebrow lashes and I didn't even realize I was doing it quite honestly but I now know enough about stress to know that uh, luckily the nuns noticed I was doing it and they talked to my parents and got you know basically they, they found out what was going on I didn't know what was going on it was subconscious but you know I noticed I was doing that so here's the thing I wanted to mention to you after the deal was done I craved food. I don't mind telling you that. I, you know, it was just like, <laughs> let me get the fridge for a while here. Um, but the other thing I noticed, and I don't know if any of you can relate to this, I found myself sitting on my bed, looking at my laptop as I am now, and I was doing this. Have any of you ever found yourself doing that? Just rocking. And then I'd go, I'm rocking. So I'd stop. And then I'd distract myself for a while. And the next thing is I'd be rocking. Anybody got any input on that? I'd like to know if anybody else ever does it. And do you know... Why you do it? It's a comfort thing. Yes, Beth. Because it's like a child being rocked, all right? Uh, and it's subconscious, but I think they call it self-nurturing, I think is what it's called, Beth. But I, I noticed I was doing it. It slows your mind. Yes, but I wasn't consciously doing it, right? It was a subconscious thing that was happening. So you don't have to mention it, Nyasha. So, because, so what I thought I'd do is, I thought I'd talk a bit about that. That sometimes your body does things subconsciously, and, but you need to be aware of them. Right, there's a reason why it's doing it. So I looked at what my body was doing and I smiled and I said to my inner child, I said, Hi, honey, 
was that a little stressful for you? <laughs> for you? And I could literally hear this voice say, uh-huh. <laughs> You know, uh -huh. and I went, it's okay. You just do what you need to do to get comfortable again. All right, so that's interesting. Jody's saying, yes, I have rocked like that after my major medical diagnosis. Body is in surviving mode. Yes, right? Your body is trying to get rid of some of the stress. And look at how my body was trying to calm me down after all that stress. Now, you know I've been fasting um, for 18 days or something nonstop. I stopped fasting that day. Uh, not that I'm not going back to it, but it was like, I am not fasting. I My body's got enough going on. I, I don't need to fast as well. I got a feeling I'm going to be burning up quite a few calories. So just in stress, right? So then what I did was I just said, okay, you don't have to fast. Um, you know, you, you can go back to fasting on Monday. <laughs> Give yourself a bit of a break here. Be kind, is what I kept saying to myself. Um, all right, so you're saying, is what I do of a child? No, I think it's what what I do, you know, this pulling of my eyelashes when I was a child or whatever, was what I did when I didn't know I had an anxiety problem, Yasha. Does that make sense? I didn't know I had an anxiety problem. Um, luckily, the adults saw what I was doing, and they knew that was not normal behavior. Um, so, I, I, Beth, Beth, would you agree that some of the behaviors you had when you we first met you were um, anxiety issues? All right. Okay, Jody. Um, you know, there were anxiety issues, and you you played them out, all right, in, in different ways. And, you know, the most incredible thing is you gained confidence, you also dropped a lot of those behaviors. So to me, Niasha, it's just a, you know, it's just a, hello, I'm more, I am more anxious than I am cared to admit. But the good news is, Niasha, and I want you to really know this, the good news and the reason why I am so impressed with you is you are talking about things, you know, bit by bit that probably are going to do you a lot of good because you've had to deny these things. You've had to keep these things hidden from people because nobody understood you, all right, and nobody understood what was going on with you, and they made fun of you, and they shamed you for behaviors. I think the difference is that you are now in a group of people that understand some of these behaviors you have, all right? And the fact you're looking at them and asking yourself and, and asking me about them shows that you want to learn and you want to, you know, heal those parts of you. Great job. I'm so impressed with you, really, Niasha. So don't be, just be aware, all right? Be aware that my body just started to tell me that it needed to slow down a bit, and it did it by moving slowly, right? You see this? It was just rocking slowly. And as Beth said, it was comforting me. I was being rocked like a baby would be rocked. All right? That's what you do with the baby that's upset you, rock them. And then... I look now at things and I say, what do I need to let go of to be to have peace of mind? You know, I would deal with the anxiety I had in my teens a different way had I known what I know now. I know, Niasha, that you're already saying, how come nobody taught me these things 10, 20 years ago? Well, they didn't because they didn't know. You understand? You can't blame people for what they don't know. They can't teach you what they don't know. You know, that's, you know, so you have to let that go. <laughs> People cannot teach you what they don't know. Does that make sense, Niasha? The fact that you are learning these things on your own is, you know, just amazing. <laughs> you know, it's just like, good for you. Um, so I look at it and I go, my job now um, with... You know, by the time they clear the subjects on my house, I will have six weeks left 
to get up and go. Oh, let me rephrase that. Find somewhere to go, <laughs> get up and go. So, you know, plus deal with, you know, moving all the, you know, um, internet and the, you know, all that stuff, telephones, you name it, all that oh, mailing addresses, you, you know, all that stuff, lots of stress. So the the thing is how to do it with the minimum amount of stress. And hopefully you will travel this journey with me. All right. Sinesh is saying this was never told to me about anxiety issues. Mama Sal, I think that I think the Lord sent me to you because now I'm seeing things I never saw before. Wow. So what do you do to get rid of them? You keep growing. Nyasha. Ask Beth. Beth needed to see that what she was doing was caused by anxiety in different ways. Uh, Beth needed to see that her family used her like a servant. Um, a, you know that you know she ended up because she thought that was what a good mother did. Um, <clears throat> you know there were a lot of things going on for with Beth, and and Beth realized what she was doing and realized why she was doing it. All right. So uh, once we could build up Beth's self-confidence that she didn't have to do all these things for people more than capable of doing it for themselves, once she could feel that and, and, and see that it was true, she changed a lot in a hurry. All right. And it was just a case of she needed the time to get all those ducks in a row. So if you've got anxiety issues, the question is, where is the anxiety? Yes, Nyasha, you're trying hard to accept the fact that they didn't know, and they still don't know, all right? And they don't know how to help you, which is why they get upset when you show these things because they can't fix it, okay? Now, you know, anybody else would say, if I've got a child with those problems, I'd get them to a doctor. But your thing is uh, that you don't even trust the doctors. So, you know, you, you've got a lot of stuff going on. And so to me, it's like, keep reading, keep learning, keep asking questions, and we will support you as best we can. But obviously, we are not medical professionals, and we're not mental professionals either. <laughs> well, we're pretty mental. Um, but you understand. So, you know, but I think you're doing a great job. I, I You know, just keep doing what you're doing. The good news about learning about these things, Niasha, I believe, is that we will only start talking about them when we're ready to start fixing them. The fact that you are talking about them now is the greatest thing because it means that you are prepared to overcome that embarrassment by talking about it just so that you can start working on it. See, it's the first step. The first step is acknowledging it. Beth will tell you that. All right. Jody will tell you that. Jody. When I met Jody, Nyasha, Jody was an absolute control freak um, in, in certain ways, and understandably so. And also, she had a second thing going for her, which was that she could not say no to anybody. You know, it was just like she would turn herself into a pretzel to help everybody. And it's just like, no, I don't think so. <laughs> So when I first met Jody, I used to sit here and laugh and go, really? <laughs> you know, she says she was a pure mess, but a delightful mess. And, you know, I kept asking her the same questions I asked you, Niasha. And I'm going, why do you do that, Jody? What? Why do you do that? That is an adult. They're more than capable of doing it. So, and by the way, did you try saying no? <gasps> I can't say no. <laughs> you know, and I'm going, yeah, actually you can. Um, you know, so, you know, it was all, but like you, Niasha, and Beth as well, all right, is that if you don't know how to cope with these things, then how can you do it? So you're doing a great job. I think everybody in this room will tell you, it's not just me, you know, blowing sunshine up your rear end. This, everybody in the room will tell you the growth they've seen in you in the last few months has been incredible. All right. Are you getting up without your parents waking you up yet? That's what we all love to know. 
Are you tidying your room because you're an adult? Or do you wait for your mother to tidy it? Do you clean your room? Or do you wait for your mother to, to clean it? <laughs> yeah. And Jody, yes, isn't that true, Jody? That was a real eye-opener that day, wasn't it? No is a complete sentence. You do not have to justify the no. Uh, can can you do X, Y, and Z? No. I have to bite my lip, Jody. Do you? <laughs> I have to go. No. <laughs> and I, I sort of bite my lip so I don't say the next bit. All right, so Niyash is saying, and it has to be so very true because the thought of stress comes around just about the time when it happens. I wanted to let others know, but the mental hurt I endured, I would go into yourself. Yes, Niyasha, totally understand that you went inwards. That is what depression is. Anger, in my view, I, I've said to a lot of people that, in my view, my depression was anger turned inwards. In other words, I didn't feel I could get angry with the people that were upsetting me. And I turned that anger inwards onto myself. Hi, Nada. Good to see you. There's another person growing a lot. Nada, how are you doing, honey? Yes, and Jody's saying, you know, what, what she learned was to stop that instinct to follow up and explain why she said no. It doesn't matter why you said no. It's none of their business. You just said no. You're doing a bit better. Of course you are, Nada. <laughs> we all are. Did you hear? I think I've sold my house. And we're busy discussing all the um, stress. <laughs> that, that, is a, that is about to hit me, that I need to be grateful for because this stress that is about to hit me wouldn't be happening if I haven't sold my house. Yeah, thanks, Nada. Um, do you understand that? I keep reminding myself, you know, you knew this was coming. <laughs> you just didn't know when. So what I'm going to be doing is, is to continue to talk to you all about what I'm doing to reduce the stress, plus, have you noticed I've been doing this while I'm talking to you? I've just noticed that I'm doing this. <laughs> I'm talking about what I've noticed with my physical reactions. Have you, did you, anybody notice that? That I started rocking while I was talking to you. Okay, so Niesh is saying, tidy my room is a yes, but mom still comes in to tidy. I don't know why. But you do tidy your room. Good. Do do dust it. Do clean it. You're doing a great job. Yeah, you notice Nada, right? So I was talking about that Nada, which is as soon as I as soon as I did the deal, and it it was done. I I noticed myself rocking. I think there's part of me. I don't know if this makes sense. There's part of me that doesn't want to get too excited, right? Because until the till those subjects come off, I haven't sold it, in my view. It's only an offer at this point that I've accepted. It's not sold until those subjects come off. Yes, Niesha, exactly. Niesha saying, I haven't learned to say no yet without explanation, but it's a work in progress. I want to say that in your case, I think it's good that you do explain the no at the moment, right? With your parents and with, with, because basically, basically you're trying to teach them how you think instead of just being upset, you're trying to put words around what you're thinking. And I think you should continue to do that myself. Oh, that's interesting. Ned is saying, I might be moving at the end of the summer, so I understand a tiny bit of how you feel. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, um, and you know, it's interesting because I, I try to stay really honest with my realtor as well. You know, I, I've, I've said to them, 
you know, that when they first brought me the offer, I, you know, I, I was upset. When I say upset, I was disappointed to start with. And then they told me, well, we need to play the game because of their culture and da, da, da. I went, okay, fine. And then I did all the math. Um, you know, you know, I worked out where that final point would probably land. And I don't mind telling you, I started to cry. When I say I started to cry, literally the tears started to roll out of my eyes. And what I asked myself, because, you know, this is the new me, now that we've been learning about this emotional intelligence, I'm going, why are you crying? You're doing it subconsciously, but why are you, why are you crying? And I realized that I was crying for the amount of money. I was crying for the difference between the original amount of money that the house went on the market for and the reality amount of money. I was crying for this loss. Does that make sense to anybody? Okay. But, you know, I had a little chat to my inner child, and I said, you didn't lose that money. Honey, you need to know you didn't lose that money. This was not a realistic figure based on a dead market. This was Disneyland, but it was worth the try, and it didn't happen. We know this is a realistic price because somebody's prepared to buy the house at that. And the difference is not loss. I never had this money anyway. And then the other thing I needed to do, right, because it's important. I hope this is helping some of you. The other thing I needed to do was to remember back in 1999, I bought the house at this amount, and it has increased in value to the reality price, and that is very healthy. Okay? And I needed to be grateful. Do you understand? I needed to let go of the loss thoughts and go be grateful. It was a good investment. You did well, and... Um, funny enough, one of the things that Benji reminded me of um, way back was, remember, Sal, that if you had invested this money in the stock market, if you had invested this money in, you know, whatever, you would not have made the return that you have made on your house. Well done. It was a good investment. I said, yeah, it was, and I'm happy. So do you also understand, and that was the point I was trying to make to Beth, that whatever money I put into house number two, let's call it number two for now, whatever money I lock in here is money I want to hang on to for my old age care. Okay? So I'm actually going to spend this amount of money to lock it away. Does that make sense? Because when I get to old age, I will then sell this property. Now, I won't make the sort of returns that I've made on this one, but that's what I'm doing. Jody, you understand I'm locking the money away so I can't spend it. So, <laughs> that's what I did. When I bought this house, I locked the money away so I couldn't give it away to my friends. You know, when I got an inheritance, the first thing I said was, I need to buy something in a hurry. Because for every day that money sits in my bank account, I'll be trying to help my friends. So, you know, I need to lock it away because that's money that needs to look after me. And I've, I'm really proud of myself, quite honestly. I'm really proud that I, I took the the risks that I did to buy the property. I'm really proud of the fact that here I am. Uh, and, you know, in a couple of months, um, if I do this correctly, which I believe that I can, if I do this correctly, I will be totally out of debt. No mortgage, no debt. How do you think that will feel?
Now, here is the, here's another thing I want you to get your head wrapped around because this is another decision. I've got a choice, all right, which is to buy an apartment, buy an apartment, or I can buy a manufactured home. All right, with the amount of money I've got. I don't want another house. I don't want all the upkeep and everything else. So this is what I'm looking at, all right? An apartment is going to give me less light unless I get a corner unit. Does that make sense? If I get a corner unit that's got windows on two sides, I'm going to be in a much better position. If I'm in a, I, I'm not going to be in the middle where I haven't got windows on my sides. It would drive me insane, right? I'm used to a lot of light. So a manufactured home, you know, has windows all the way around it, which is why I like that. Um, so to me, this is my first thought is to go for this because in my older age, you know, I can end up here, you know, and be happy. But right now I still need the other things. So the other things that I need to look at, all right, this is the difficulty. If I buy an apartment, your average costs would probably be, uh, you know, what they call it, the, um, strata fee or whatever you know it might be about 300 bucks a month right uh, somewhere in there but it would include heat and light and those sort of things most of the time if i get a manufactured house the pad rent you know where it actually sits is going to cost me about a thousand a month now when you look at those two that's quite a difference right so what I'm going to be doing if I buy a manufactured home is basically throwing a thousand bucks a month down the drain, if you want to think of it that way. But here is my thinking. I will be happier. All right. First of all, the manufactured home is going to cost me about... Over a hundred thousand dollars less. Okay. Okay, Nia, no problem. So if I look at it and say, if I go in knowing that this manufactured home probably I want for the next 10 years. So let's say that for 10 years that's going to be. It's going to be twelve thousand a year, so it's going to add one hundred and twenty thousand dollars, right? Do you understand what I'm saying? It's going to be a thousand a month times twelve months times ten years would be one hundred and twenty thousand. That basically is going to be giving the money to somebody else just so I can live. How many of you understand that I have? looked at that and said, am I prepared to put $120,000 into somebody else's pocket so I can have light and space? How many of you rent an apartment? Right? You're doing that. I'm going, yeah, I'm prepared to do that. By the way, there's part of me, listen to this one, there's part of me that goes, what if I just rent? Right? There's part of me that goes there. But if I just rent, I'll spend my money. <laughs> so I need to buy. I need to lock up some money. All right, but do you understand the difference between those two? Plus, living here, my heating and everything else will be extra. So, you know, I've still got quite a bit of expenses here. Whereas here, I wouldn't have. So if I can find this at a good price and it's a corner unit with lots of light, that probably isn't a bad idea. But then I wouldn't be able to have <laughs> I wouldn't be able to have my workshop or all my tools or everything else. So, you know, it's about quality of life now. Think about that. So, yeah, exactly, Jody. So that's what I had to let go of is thinking that was a bad idea. I'm going, people do it all the time. People who aren't as lucky as I am. So what makes for quality of life, right? 
right? That's what I had to look at. So you understand the the manufactured home gives me light, which you know is important to me. It gives me space, which is important to me. And it, it's downsizing, probably. Not necessarily. I might end up with more space than I have now. <laughs> Not a bad thing. If I go into an apartment, I can, uh, I can probably only afford um, a one, maybe at a stretch, a two-bedroom apartment. So I'm, I'm, and I will lose light, and I will lose space. So you see, I'm looking at if I only have ten years to live. Think about this one. If I only have ten years to live, will the extra thousand a month on pad rent be a waste of money? I don't think so. I think these will be, my next 10 years will be really important for me to have quality of life, right? While I'm still able to, to, to do things, I think quality of life. Plus, I will have more money to play with. And when I say play with, you know, I'll be able to talk to the Amazon man a bit more, you know, or whatever. I'll be able to be able to buy the paints that I want. and. So what I want you all to do is to understand that some people will see that as a waste of money. Do you understand? Jody, do you get it that I expect to be criticized by some people for this decision, including my bank, probably? Part of me, yeah, exactly, Sharon, right? If you will be happy, there and can afford it, go for it. There's no guarantee I'll be happy there, Sharon. You know, I might end up with the neighbors from hell. But at least, <laughs> at least I can go and shut the doors and have enough space that I'm not going to be claustrophobic. I'll be able to flirt with Amazon, yes, you know, and wish. <gasps> by the way, by the way, guys, hang on a second. <laughs> Jody, you you just are very biased. Jody's saying, I think you've got every angle covered, and I'm so proud of you. Plan A to Z and back again. <laughs> I wonder if you could interview the neighbors before purchasing. Yeah, um, or the neighbors' neighbors, perhaps. All right, people, I've got to show you my latest score talking about the Amazon thing. Um, some of you know that I am diabetic or pre-diabetic, and I've had this um, diabetic kit for uh, since what December and it's time for me to get more of these strips and the uh, pokey things as I call them lance lancets I think they're called lancets um, and so this is my reality my reality is that these cost me about 80 bucks here in Canada just for the strips all right all right. So being who I am, <laughs> I wondered whether Amazon had them any cheaper. And I sort of looked at them and that was fine. And then I went, I wonder whether Wish does. Do any of you buy on Wish? Now, remember, just the strips alone are going to cost me 80 bucks here. So I, I went to Wish. And guess what? I found a complete kit. Oh, the actual machine isn't in here at the moment, but a complete kit, and you know, a new machine, strips, pokey things, everything for 25 bucks. Now, what, what was the natural fear? Will it work? Right? By the way, the, the container for this is actually much better quality than the one I've got. Um, 
so my thing was, oh, that is awesome. Sharon's saying that she became a great grandmother. Dixie Fields entered the world at nine pounds, 10 ounces and 22 inches long. You're going to travel to meet her in three weeks. That's incredible. Um, Jody, uh, Sharon, can I tell the peeps that? If so, Jody, can you just take a screenshot of that for me? Okay, so here's the thing. It would have cost me 80 bucks just to replace the strips, but for 25 bucks, I got strips and the pokey things and a new machine. Now, on the downside, on the downside, <laughs> it speaks Chinese, the machine, all right? When it, it talks, but it talks in Chinese. So the question is, do I care? You see, once you know how to take your blood glucose, and once you understand what the numbers mean, right? I didn't give a continental you-know-what, that it talks Chinese. I can let go of that. <laughs> I don't need to learn a new language. I need the number. The number is the same. <laughs> it actually doesn't do Chinese numbers. It does real numbers, you know, European numbers, whatever. So how many of you can see that was quite a score? I have just saved myself, you know, and now when I go back, I'm just going to buy their strips and their pokey things, <laughs> right? Um, which I haven't checked, but I'm pretty certain they're going to be a much better price. And if necessary, I'll buy another machine, you know, upgrade the machine every now and then. Now, the reason I'm telling you is in case you have anybody that's diabetic in your family, that you might want to let them know that. It's like, it works. And how do I know it works? Well, you know what I did, don't you? Right? <laughs> Took one reading on both machines to see if they matched, and they did. <laughs> so sometimes being a little adventurous is not a bad thing. Stealth, Jody, you bet. Now, I know some of you have got it all covered under your medical plan, but I don't, all right? The same thing as I was saying um, you know, to somebody else um, that, you know, I, I buy my glasses online now. I, I don't, you know, I have my eyes tested at, at the local place and I get the results from my local place and I get it, you know, and then I go and buy my glasses online because I have all the measurements, you know, the distance between my pupils and all those other things. And I just buy my glasses online and the difference is about 500 bucks, <laughs> literally 500 bucks because uh, I like progressive uh, transition lenses, you know, ones that when I go outside, they turn into sunglasses automatically, um, you know, and those sort of things. And I want to tell you, I've been doing that for about 10 years now. And I, I would not go, you know, I literally remember one optometrist saying to me, um, it's the one I use is called Clearly. And I, I don't know if it's in the States because it's in, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah. I am um, geographically challenged in Canada. But the one I use is called Clearly. It used to be called Clearly Contacts. Um, but now it's just called Clearly because they do so many glasses as well. And, you know, the, the, the choice of glasses are just magical. You know, so it's, and they actually will, you know, you, you sort of see the shape of your face and I think it takes a screenshot or something and then and then it'll show you what your glasses will look like on you. Yeah, you know, it's that it's all so digitally brilliant these days. Um yeah, so transition lenses, I would not get a pair of glasses without transitions on them. I I've had transitions on my lenses for 
20, 30 years now. I think, you know, I don't know how long they've been around, but probably for as long as they've been around. Because I'm not, a, uh, you know, why buy two pairs of glasses? Why buy one for indoors and one for outdoors? That's insane. If you need glasses, I want one pair of glasses. You know me, I, I don't do things well. Somebody was saying to me about, you know, um, can, can I wash this in a washing machine? And I go, you have to understand in my life, if this piece of clothing doesn't want to be washed in a washing machine, it's not for me. All right. Or, you know, today you can get dry oil and you can do it in the washing machine anyway. So <laughs> I, I am definitely um, the stealth shopper, as, as Jody would say. Yeah. So isn't that amazing, though, that just in one purchase, I have found A, it works, and B, I can help a lot of people save a lot of money if they choose to. But you have to be prepared to listen to that little voice talk to you in Chinese. And, you, you know, I go, I have no idea what you're saying, honey, but I don't need to. Bye-bye for now. <laughs> you know what I mean? <coughs> you can imagine, I do talk to my machine. Yeah, it talks to me, so I talk back. She, blah, 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 and I go, mm -hmm. thank you, honey. I appreciate the input, whatever it was. No idea what it was. Bye for now. <laughs> oh, gosh. All right, everybody. So <laughs> um, keep your fingers crossed and pray to whatever is what you pray to, and that everything will unfold as it should. One of the things I've said is that if this is the right sale of the house, then it will all go through without a problem. And if it isn't, then it won't. And, you know, I'll be back to showing the house again. <laughs> so it's not going to be messed up until I know it's a done deal. And I, you know, done deal is that, you know, they've taken all those subjects off and we're good to go. And I will then have six weeks to pack up and go. Wow. So I've looked at all the possibilities. What if I don't find the right place in time? You know, then I may end up just renting somewhere for a few months. All right. Um. You know, I don't want to be forced into a purchase. How many of you can see that with me? It's like, uh, I'm not going to do this just because I have to. I, I need to do it so it's right. So it may mean that I, I need to leave here and move into a hotel or, you know, buy a secondhand fifth wheel and live in it for a couple of months. Mm-mm. No. Oh, I'd need a new truck as well. Um, so, you know, those sort of things, you know, it's like how many how many possibilities? You understand if I've thought through all the options. I said to Marnie, you know, for those of you who know my friend Marnie, she's got a, she's got a motorhome. I said, I may need the motorhome. <laughs> you know, or, or your couch, you know, or something. Um, and you know something? I know that they'd be more than happy to help me. So this is like, it it's doable. If I'm, you know, if I find the right place, uh, all the financing and everything else will fall into place and it'll be good. Um, but, you know, there's a possibility that I won't be able to clear the financing and get the bridging loan. And if that happens, I've got to wait to get the money before I can buy the next place. All right. If for some reason I don't qualify because I'm retired, da, 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 da. or I go to some other lender, maybe not as reputable as the bank, and borrow the money. People do it all the time. So you know, it's just like um, Jody. You're right, right? It's like you, you. I, I'm trying to make sure that I've thought as many of these things through as I can. All right, and got option and plan A, B, and C. How many of you can hear that? <laughs> that it's like I don't have um I don't have one plan. <laughs> I have if this works, I'm gonna do this, and if this doesn't work, I'm gonna do that. And you know, that helps me stay out of stress to a large extent. But I think all of you know that moving whether you're moving from one apartment to another that you're renting or moving a whole house that you're downsizing and selling and changing your life, you know, it's stressful. 
So we can do this together. And I really thank you for being here to, to help me through this time. <laughs> and I'm hoping that you are finding it interesting. All right. I'm hoping that as I tell these stories, you know, that you learn how to cope with your stuff a little better. Because that was my intent. All right. My intent always has been if I can do this the right way, then maybe I can help other people um, learn a new way along the way. So let me know if you're watching it on the replay. Um, let me know. Uh, whether this has given you some ideas, you know, from the whole thing of, you know, do you want to save some money on diabetic uh, stuff? Uh, or do you, you know, want to understand more about negotiation? All right. And the truth is, when you're doing a negotiation, it's simple. Both parties want to feel they did well. Neither party will get what they wanted. All right. Exactly. But you want to end up that both parties think it's a fair deal. And the difference in that price was how much did the buyer want the house? You and I both know that the buyer wanted it a lot to come up that last 15,000. That meant they really wanted the house. And I'm more than happy to sell it to them. <laughs> and get out of debt and start my life again. So, thank you for being here. Really important to me. And as we continue this journey, do you want me to carry on being as honest about what's happening to me physically, mentally, and um, realistically? You know, is that, is that something I should continue to do? Is what I'm trying to find out. Is it helping you? I don't want to sit here and just keep talking about my stuff. It is helping Nada. Okay, good. It's good to hear Nada. Um, because, you know, it is important. And Nada, you know, have you started, um, have you started packing? If you might have to move at the end of the summer. All right. And it's helping Sharon as well. Good. And Jody. All right. Every, all right. Um, because what I really recommend is, you know, pack the way that I downsized, which is systematically every day. First of all, I love packing in banker boxes. Do you know what I mean, Nada? Banker boxes because they, a lot of stuff fits into a banker box, right? But also they're easy to handle. And when you reach the other side, they are easy to put against a wall and throw a piece of material over them. And you can unpack them as slowly as you want. All right. Make sure you mark them well. But what I like about banker boxes is they are all the same size. All right. They're not big, clumsy things that you can't handle. You know, each one of them you can handle. And you will be amazed how much of your stuff you can get into banker boxes. What I can't get into banker boxes are, you know, some of my clothes. My clothes I just will throw into garbage bags, actually see-through bags, you know, leaf bags, so people can see their clothes and don't throw them out. Um, I will throw my clothes into the into um, clear bags and put a tape around them so they'll be in sets of, say, about eight or ten, right, uh, coat hangers, and they will be taped up and ready to go. Um, so sh what I'll do, Nada, is I I'll show you what I'm doing as I do it, right? The, the only things that I will use the bigger boxes for will be the very last things I pack. In other words, the very... Right. I've been doing those videos all along. Now, this is one of them. All right. I talked about the negotiation today of how I did the negotiation. So, but what I'm doing now, the very last boxes I pack. By the way, another thing, Nada, I really recommend this and to any of you that have to move. I literally will write on the, let's say I'm in my, packing up my kitchen. 
I will put everything in from the drawer underneath the microwave, okay? My present house. And but I will mark the box drawer from under the microwave. That's what I will write on the box. So if in my mind, where did I have that? Well, that used to be in the drawer under the microwave. I just that's what I'm looking for in the box. All right, I mark each drawer, the stuff that's in each drawer. I put it in a shoebox or whatever, but it goes into the box and the box is marked where it was. I just don't huck it all in there and put kitchen. I put literally where was this in my kitchen? I want to tell you it saves you so much time. And <laughs> you're saying yes, but you want more videos. Okay. <laughs> I will do that. It's not the videos that are a problem, Nada. Jody will tell you my problem is not making videos. I've probably got six of them sitting at the moment waiting to be edited. My problem is finding the time to edit them because that takes three or four hours. And so, you know, <laughs> you understand the difference, honey. <laughs> but if I can let go of the fact that that's three hours wasted and see it as three hours of relaxation and creativity. Jody, just keep reminding me of that. And, you know, <laughs> I might need that time. <laughs> just to balance out my mind. And by the way, just so you all know, I intentionally um, I intentionally made time to um, just do a little bit of tidying up with some beer mats and things that I was making because I realized I needed to balance out my mind from all the stress of the high negotiations. <laughs> and so I'm going to be doing a bit more of that probably today and tomorrow, just until my mind settles down and I stop rocking thing. <laughs> Got a little bit too much adrenaline pumping through, I think. All right, everybody. So big hugs. Thank you for being here. And we will chat to you this evening, those of you who are available. <coughs> Please feel free, if you're watching on the replay, to leave comments below, ask any questions that you may have, and let me know what you'd like to see more of. It's always a pleasure. Don't forget to subscribe somewhere. <laughs> I never know where that is. I think it's there. Yeah. It should be my face there. If so, yeah, click on that. That's your subscribe button. Uh, click the little bell thing, right? Um, that, that will make sure that you get advised of any time I'm going live. For those of you who don't know, um, all the viewing times or the stream times are on my website, dearmamasal.com, and there's a tab that says broadcast. All right? Nope, the other side. It's on this side? Ah, it's reversed. Thank you, Jody. So my little face is over there. <laughs> it's good to know. Everything is reversed, right? All right. So <laughs> lovely. All right, guys. I need to go and um I see that my realtor sent me a couple of things and I better go and sort that out before she panics. This is dear Mama Cells. <laughs> We'll see you this evening. It's 7 o'clock Pacific time. I'll put up the notification as soon as I know what I'm doing. Not as soon as I know what I'm doing, but you know what I mean. This is dear mama as I was saying. Remember to look after one another. But as you have heard, as you have heard, please. Ah, Jody's saying the subscribe button is over there. So you can't see my little picture there. It just says subscribe. Ah, that's where we're confused. Okay, thank you, Jody. Good to know. I'll check it on the replay. <laughs> this is Dear Mama Sal saying, look after one another. But please, 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 especially if you are in high stress situation, please look after yourself. All right? And do whatever you need to do to balance yourself out, as I am doing. Be aware of what your body is telling you, as I am doing. And just understand it just is what it is. It will sort itself all out. How many of you know that regardless of what goes down, I'm going to end up moving and starting the next phase of my life? And you're going to come with me. Bye-bye for now.